I wake up every morning and I look in the mirror and I say for five minutes, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. No, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And then the phone rings and I say, sure, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> so I'm moderating the session having not participated in any discussions on this topic prior to now, and there's a hand up. <laughs> so I'll help you out. Um, I guess I'd like us to be cautious about talking about standards of care in a setting where the community will not be able to exercise this standard of care for many years to come. We won't have the resources, we don't have the knowledge, and we don't have the tools that will be available to us. Um, it, the process is laudatory. We definitely want to be able to do this, and I'm grateful that it's possible, but please don't tell us that this is going to be standard of care in five years because there's not enough money for it. I'd say that also it's hard to identify or define what standard of care is for a disease that, that is one off. really one off, yes. Yeah. Yes? I'd also like to bring up around your point towards therapy. I mean, I think one of the things that we're seeing is, is that how we're defining therapy is also interesting in that often these people are misdiagnosed. Uh, and they're being treated inappropriately. And so I would categorize if you're taking them off the wrong medications or you're taking them away from surgeries and you're taking them into a realm where the parents then can make some reproductive choices, those are also uh, laudable outcomes that we find that the families are interested in. But the misdiagnosis in this game is huge. And the number of times patients are taking the inappropriate drugs is also big. So I think we have to be careful on treatment towards cure and then better management of the case, even when we don't know something. And right, right, going, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Uh, yeah, going on to that, because, I, I mean, it was very provocative. I, I would just unbalance to say that uh, there is a difference between a treatment slash cure versus something being actionable, because you use both words. And I think a lot of things are actionable once a diagnosis is made. So, you know, so I, 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 I hope that the success of this enterprise will not only be judged by, oh, we've cured it by some gene therapy, because that, for sure, it won't happen only in, in a minuscule amount of, of, of cases. But, but working on actionable features, I think, is a possibility. And for the second point that was interesting about epigenetics and environmental, I agree that this is too small of a sample. I would leave. I, I would leave it to, there is a small window if there are cohorts of similar patients with similar genetic variants in which the environmental studies could help understand variations in the phenotype. Uh, is the cohort big enough? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So uh, I wanted to say a comment about the bioinformatics uh, aspect of this that a lot of people, uh, <clears throat> a couple of other presenters uh, talked about. And I think knowing that how uh, stressed uh, the bioinformatics support in most institutions is, I don't think anybody is going to take voluntarily, take on this task of uh, developing some sort of bioinformatic tool that will integrate all this data. And the only way that is going to happen is if um, uh, the Common Fund or NSGRI thinks about um, uh, putting out an RFA. And so that there is money behind, I think it's a very worthwhile project, and one of the metrics that we're going to look at downstream, 10 years downstream, what happened to that data is going to depend upon that buy from export. And I think we need to have a some sum of money there, maybe based on our RFA, which the UDN or the uh, 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 Common Fund can help write, to ask, you know, institutions uh, or experts who, are, who do this day in, day out basis that, hey, here's the data set. Tell us how we can better integrate it and so that it can help people. And that needs to be thought about now so that the RFA can go out in a year, two years, and that by the end of the eight, nine years uh, uh, project uh, or UDN cycle, uh, we have some uh, tangible website or tools. One thing that um, on this question that's up here, um, Having just sat in on meetings in my institution about uh, ideas of restructuring the, the graduate programs in, in uh, biological sciences, um, you can get through our programs in molecular biology or cell biology without ever having seen a picture of an entire whole organ. 
uh, much less a vertebrate uh, organism. Likewise, many of our medical students, who will then go on to be residents and fellows, think that CRISPR is a breakfast cereal. And so I think yes. you can't, I mean, you can't have education that is going to make everybody an expert in everything. But I, I'm interested in thoughts of, of the group about ways that this network and participants in, the, participants in this network could help bridge that gap some by having, uh, you know, at least some level of education for the, the molecular geneticists or the genomicists on, on uh, diseases and how they affect physiology. And likewise, for those who come through the medical route and residency and fellowship, how to better incorporate knowledge of some of these things other than just, I'm going to send a genetic test. So I want to add to that, that, they, that those people need to think about developmental genetics. In other words, um, as a pediatrician, I can't help but think there are different pathophysiologies at different ages. The reasons drugs don't work or kill a baby is because they've got a different physiology. And the, the thing is, by the time you get to an adu adulthood, you may have been warped by something that happened three or four steps earlier. And I think there, it's really important as we're searching through this genetic pile to think of something that actually happened and was functioning at an earlier stage. Paul. So we've already adapted a um, rotation for residents and med students. So we've got neurology, medicine, genetics. I mean, I don't, it won't happen overnight, but I, I think it is an increment toward changing mindsets. Good. I think it's still a problem that that transition, that integration requires you finding the right person at the right time. I think we have, I mean, the basic problem is that cell biology and clinicians use completely different terminology. If, if we shared terminology, if there were quantitative phenotypes in the clinic, you wouldn't need special informatics that is essentially designed to capture ontologies. It would be based on actually rigorous quantitative measurements in multiple dimensions. That's the fundamental problem, I think, is that we speak different languages. We haven't spent any time integrating, you know, Howard mentioned it earlier, everybody will have completely perfected every back-end pipeline long before any clinician on the planet is able to actually, in real time, use that information to manage a patient. Yeah, I, I run a developmental biology program at Baylor College of Medicine, and what we're trying to do is entice uh, MD-PhDs as well as MDs to come and work in our labs. Uh, Brandon runs a program that does that. And I think that's very, that's for my lab has been very efficient because they bring the language and they learn the science and the scientists in the lab, the PhDs learn, you know, the nomenclature and the process. And for the UDN, that's been very useful. And I think we can, we're trying to institutionalize that by bringing that into some of the coursework. And I think this is an avenue that should be pursued uh, in other programs as well. What could be done maybe at a network level? So I, I know that Eric had to leave, but um, there, for one thing I'm familiar with, there's a summer course at Aspen, of all places, generally, on experimental neurotherapeutics, where it's basically four to five days of pretty intensive education and experience in um, clinical trials, design, and methodology for uh, uh, neurologic diseases. And whether there might be some mechanism to support something like that that would be done by the network that would provide, again, four to five days uh, through, one would hope, some funded mechanism um, to provide something that is, is really at, at multiple levels. Much of it would be didactic, but there would certainly be opportunity for something other than that. Um, but it, it seems like this network is in a position where they could really, uh, you know, bring, bring some uh, um, outreach, I guess, to young people who are interested in this kind of field. Other thoughts on this, the virtuous cycle? The bench to bedside, to bench to bedside, to bench to bedside? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it seems to me that in matchmaker, either gene match or matchmaker exchange, there are a lot of variants or, or proposed deleterious variants in there, but I don't often see the basic scientists who are interested and have expertise in those genes. You do sometimes, but not often enough. I wonder if there's anything that NIH could do in terms of pushing their funded scientists or that we could do in terms of getting the word out in the community to do more of that. It's because they're not aware of it. I, I start getting emails now of when, when I give talks and I mention gene matcher, it sparks. It creates a spark, but it's they're not coming to your talks, and you know it's just uh, the two communities are too separate. That's mm -hmm. why mixing the communities is is really important in this case. I know there are a few uh, few graduate programs, relatively new, that are in translational biomedical sciences, which basically. Um, many of these are through the CTSIs, but the goal there is not to have this neuroscience or molecular biology or this or that, but the, people do their dissertation research in one specific the, area, but the idea is to try to bridge different specialties with the some... The problem kind. with those programs often is they completely do not focus on mechanism, but mm -hmm. on therapeutics. And so they go for drug design without knowing why they're going for it and how. They just try. And I think that's not the right approach. The, the, these translational programs should go mechanistically and focus on mechanism and not on therapeutics. Well, that was provocative. Anybody else want to? Yes. <laughs> I, would, I would second exactly what Ugo said. I think a lot of the problems, I mean, for example, to, to push back a little bit on, on Stephen's comments, I mean, very few therapies have any mechanistic underpinnings whatsoever. I mean, the majority of therapies in clinical, utility, clinical use today have essentially zero mechanistic uh, background. Uh, and so I think that's one of the sort of corollaries um, to this entire program is the only way that you might potentially advance things is getting a diagnosis, which at least gives you a, a chance of moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I'll take a point for rebuttal. Uh, I, I used to be a cardiologist, but then I ran a big cancer center. So I agree in cardiology, nothing mechanistic known. But in cancer, the great revolution in the last you know, decade or more is mechanistically based. And if you'll remember, I did argue for mechanistic focus, which I believe will lead to therapeutics in the genetic era. Uh, but I think that's where the emphasis should be. Not, don't, not, it would be silly to try to jump to therapeutics like the animal models. But, but I still think that mechanism is going to be the main answer. And the, I take Howard's point exactly. Uh, certainly, good diagnosis can help management in many, many ways. I don't dispute that. But I'm talking about for the future of this program and the impact it's going to have, the very best thing that could happen, period, would be to go all the way to a mechanism of one of these diseases and innovate some treatment for that one patient, whether it's gene modification or whatever it is, um, you know, vitamin supplement, right? Maybe they're folate deficient, whatever it's going to be. But go all the way to that because one example will beat statistics every time when it comes to getting this funded into one of the institutes or wherever it's going to be. So I think that that needs to be the focus and avoid trying to go out and do all the other great things you, you could have an impact on. I don't disagree with the impact in medical education and the psychological response of patients and their families. I think there could be one, but I think you'll be diffuse and won't get, ultimately have the impact that this should have five and ten years from now. This is not where the funding goes though right now. We're, we're, we're supported in the model organism screening center not to do functional studies, but to just show that the variants are causative. That's the end. And we should, I agree fully, invest into mechanism. In fact, there are several cases in my lab where that's happened and already predicts a strategy as to how to pursue a bunch of projects. I think it's really important that more money is poured into that. We've. Oh, sorry, Howard. So I think that um, in terms of this point one, which we're kind of circling around, I mean, as we come back and we start thinking about the next round, you know, I think the R21s are a good program. I think having the cores are a good program. But the basic scientists often don't see a patient face. They don't see that this is a case. 
And in my experience, if you bring cases to your basic scientists, now this is a local thing, but you bring them to your basic scientists, you'll find a different kind of passion around it because it's not for a paper, it's for a case. And so one of the things I'd encourage is that we think about what this is going to look like in the future, that we need to have our basic scientists tied in with our clinics. That's exactly what we do at Baylor. All my people from my lab who work on these genes participate in the discussion, sit down, see the patients, hear the physicians, you know, present their cases, and it completely changes their attitude. And that's what should be done in the clinical sites, invite basic scientists. UCLA has people that have contacted me that they would die to work on these uh, disease genes. But if you don't invite them... I was simply going to say that, you know, I mean, we've, we've actually used model organisms to discover drugs in, uh, from, for variants taken from our clinical population. So I hear where Stephen's coming from, but I think the reality is, as Hugo says, the, the network is not funded to do this. But the other reality, I think, is that you need animal models in order to get to causation before you get to therapy. So I think one of the, the, the sort of things I'm hearing, at least, is I think it's been a theme throughout the day, is there's just so much to get our arms around here, that even just building the language whereby everybody can talk about the same problem is potentially one of the things that the network mm -hmm. is really doing. And I, and I think everybody around the table has worked fairly hard to try and do that. So all I'm saying is it, there are lots of problems that interface in this particular network. And so understanding those interfaces maybe as far as we can go uh, at a generic level, although there will definitely be individual cases where we go all the way through to therapy. Yes. So uh, for the UDP before the UDN started, there were a few cases where we were able to go from patient all the way to, to therapy. And uh, I, I guess one of the lessons of that was, A, how long it takes and how many people. And secondly, that there's not a good way of sort of industrializing that process. So it's fine to say that for a small group of patients, or especially if you have a particular interest in a lab with uh, certain expertise and we can find your lab, that's great. But how do you do this for tens and hundreds of, of patients, I think, is a particular challenge for us as a network to figure out. The way we try to do then is if we don't have expertise for a specific gene, let's say it's a gene expressed in the gut or the heart, or uh, then there's plenty of people in the community we can contact, and they're all eager to co collaborate and, and, and work with us. So I, I think you can parse it out. You just... You I think we found sort of mixed results. In other words, uh, if... Obviously, research funding is very precious, and when you ask somebody to take something on, they do a risk assessment. And um, if you found something that is interesting to you in a patient, but you can't convince the basic researcher that it overlaps enough with what they're doing, or the risk profile isn't such that putting a graduate student or a postdoc on it wouldn't be a waste of their time, that it's just been a difficult discussion for us. I remember early on we had a list of variants, and we took it into the bills. Um, uh, section lab and we said, oh, these are things we're very excited about. Nobody would touch any of it. And we realized that we had to take some extra steps to somehow connect those cases, whether it's preliminary lab work to show that there's a difference in uh, uh, protein levels or expression or something to, to make it a little bit more of a, a hook for that basic scientist to say it was worth their time. Anyway, I, I just, I think that we didn't find um, uh, a perfect answer to that problem, but that's something that we recognize as a problem, I guess, a challenge. But did you stay within the NIH or did you reach out? Well, we always try to reach out, and I think that something like what Rachel was talking about, finding a broader group of people to reach out to, because it's, you know, if we find the correct paper or if we know somebody or we try to throw as broad of a net as we can, but I'm sure there's ways to improve that as well. Okay, maybe time for one or two more comments and then we'll. Wrap up. I mean, can NIH do anything in terms of an administrative supplement to those grants to give an extra $10,000 or something to make it worthwhile enough? So we have done administrative supplements as well as R21s to follow up on variants that were found in the undiagnosed disease program and as part of the UDN funding so far. One thing from the cancer field that has emerged is the concept of co-clinical modeling and certainly at uh, Jim Anderson's life, but at ORIP, that, that was a big discussion, was thinking, and Hugo, you were there as well. How do we think about uh, paralleling some of the funding for modeling with some of the high-end disease requirements? 
So, um, interesting discussion. Um, I think this is this is the uh, sixty-four million dollar question: <laughs> is how to best do this. And I think uh, people have really pointed out some of the big challenges, particularly when it comes to the way things are funded and challenges for funding things that don't necessarily um, fit into specific categories or don't build on what has been done previously. Um, I think um, just as, a, as an observation in the, in the discussions, I think the UDN model is one where, in addition to having synergies and interactions at multiple levels of investigation within each center, I think uh, you know, there's tremendous opportunity for interactions between centers that might bring different uh, perspectives that will help move this forward. But at the end of the day, we still have many individuals who have the, are the first case of such and such that uh, it presents unique challenges uh, going forward. So I'm going to stop right there with my summary and uh, move on, and maybe we can um, get to our break a little early.